How was that? That was phenomenal. Just, just like at the beginning of a game? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Um, so uh, like the voice from above said before, my name is Pete Giorgio. I run the uh, sports practice at Deloitte. I'm very excited to be here today, and I'm just going to have everybody quickly introduce themselves. Kerry, you want to go first? Sure, absolutely. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to Las Vegas. Uh, my name is Kerry Buboltz, and I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer for uh, the Vegas Golden Knights, the newest... Uh, the Any newest fans? Yeah. Go Knights, go. <laughs> and uh, we're again, we're excited to be hosting CES as one of the biggest and best weeks uh, for our city and our community. And uh, it's just awesome to have everybody here. So looking forward to today. Hi, I'm Amy Choyne, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at the United States Tennis Association, uh, which is the national governing body of tennis in America and runs, um, obviously, the U.S. Open. Pleasure to be here. We have some tennis fans, right? No? Hopefully. Come on. Right. <laughs> Scarpy. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Scarpy Hedinson. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the Los Angeles Sports and Entertainment District. Uh, it's a 300-acre development uh, in Los Angeles. Many of you have probably heard about the stadium we're building there. And, and if you fly into LAX, you've probably seen it. But it's much more than that. It's, uh, it's a mini city that we're building with with mixed-use development, uh, retail, hotels, office space, et cetera. Uh, really happy to be here, and, uh, and uh, CES is, is great as always. Love Thank it. You. Good. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Hopper, uh, sometimes better known as Chopper. Uh, I'm the head of eSports for Riot Games for North America. Uh, Riot Games is the developer and publisher of League of Legends, which is the uh, biggest PC game in the world, and we facilitate the competitive play of that uh, around the world. I, uh, I was wondering if you're going to go with Chris or you're going to go with Chopper. So you know, most people at this point call me Chopper, yeah, except for our CFO for some reason. May, then may, I'm in trouble. So <laughs> it's Chris when I'm in trouble. Chopper the rest of the time. Uh, may May we call you Chopper? Chopper's good. All for right, me. I like it. All right, good. Good. Zach. I wish I had a cool name like Chopper. Uh, <laughs> Zach Sugarman. Sometimes people call me Shug. I serve as the senior <laughs> vice president of properties at Wasserman. We're a global culture centric consulting agency. So we work a lot and represent talent, athlete talent, influencer talent, brands and properties. Um, I'm responsible for all the properties. So I get the pleasure of working with all the wonderful people up on this stage and others, leagues, rights holders, federations, teams, really anything to help them maximize their commercial opportunity. So a lot on hardcore analytics, uh, valuation packaging, sponsorship strategy, media rights, audience insights, things like that. And Pete, I'm just making sure I get to take this chair when I'm done because it's, yeah, it's nice. really comfortable. It's like sitting on a cloud. I, really? Yes, so, yeah, and it reminds me of uh, a poodle that we have, and it, it feels very nice and comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Shug. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Good. All right, so we're here today to talk a little bit about fans and what do fans value and what are they looking for. And what we tried to do is bring a bit of a diverse perspective here. As you can see, we've got folks from a bunch of different aspects of the sports community. Um, but we, we thought we'd actually be a really interesting place to start for the group is just for everybody to talk a little bit about who do you think of as your fan, right? Fan is a very generic term, but when you think fan, who is it that you're talking about? Who is it that you think is that person who's your fan? So I don't know, Scarpa, you want to talk for a minute? So you think about the district, like yeah. the idea of a fan, how, what, does that, what does that mean for you? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different for us. I mean, we, we will have two NFL teams that play in our facility. And so, so from that standpoint, we look at fans in sort of the traditional way. But uh, we are expecting, uh, you know, somewhere, you know, sort of at, at full maturity, somewhere north of 30 million visitors annually. And so fans sort of become our guests, if you will, because we will expect our guests to come to, um, to, come to Hollywood Park, as we call it now, for different types of, of reasons, right? But regardless of whether you're coming for an NFL game or if you just want to grab a burger or watch Monday Night Football, uh, we want to treat you the same. And so I spent 18 years at the Walt Disney Company, and so some of that uh, has been ingrained in me, and, and I have still have some pixie dust, right, in my hair. So I was so, wondering what that was. Yeah. So we, we we talk a lot about guests at Disney. Uh, we are very much in that mode as well uh, at Hollywood Park.
I love it. I love it. Chopper, how do you guys think about fans? What, what, what is fans yeah, in you your know, world? Fans for us is kind of tricky because, you know, as the developer and publisher of the game, it's easy to think of fans as just the players and then differentiate that from the viewers of the eSport. And so then you get caught in the, well, is it either or is it both or kind of where's the overlap? For me, I look at our fans as really kind of anybody that fits within the ecosystem of League of Legends. And, you know, we've been fortunate enough at Riot to be able to embrace a variety of different uh, sort of media channels and outlets to allow people to express fandom. And so, you know, we have the eSport where people can be a fan of a team or a fan of the league, a fan of the competition. They can also be a fan of the game, but they can also be a fan of the IP. You know, we've put out uh, several uh, music albums that have hit the billboard charts. You know, we put out art books that people can engage with. We have a board game that people can engage with. And so for me, a fan is simply someone that wants to enjoy the competition and is sort of open to embracing it. And so that, that tends to give us a much wider spectrum of folks that we can address. I, I mean, I love that broad definition of fan, like you're connecting it. It reminds me, Amy, a lot of what the challenges that you guys have in terms of it is not just the people who watch tennis, but the people who play, right? No, absolutely. I mean, fans to us means um, a, a whole bunch of different things. You know, we have over 800,000 uh, people that come to the tournament itself. So those uh, those fans that are on, on the property um, and people on broadcast watching it from their homes. And then um, the you know tennis fan itself um, and how do you engage them? So it is a broad spectrum and, you know, the USTA as the national governing body, you know, leverages, you know, what we do with the U.S. Open and the fan experience to increase participation. So I love it. And, and do you think about it as, I mean, do you, do you count all 40 million people in the United States who play tennis as, as your fans? Uh, it's the, yes, it's 40 million plus of casual players. Um, that is an opportunity for fans, an yeah. opportunity for participation. So, you know, it's definitely, um, you know, a target. It's a large one, but it's that, a target. I like it. Yeah, that's plenty. That's enough, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Carrie, how about you guys? Well, I, I think just with uh, one of the biggest misperceptions about about our organization and our brand really has to do with this city. Mm. Um, we attract 43 million visitors a year. Uh, to Las Vegas, and, and obviously there's a lot of great entertainment options, um, but that really uh, is just a small fraction of really how we define our fan. It's certainly a component, um, but uh, if you've actually been to one of our games, and by the way, we have a game tomorrow night. He said I could plug. Uh, we're playing San Jose tomorrow night over at T-Mobile Arena. Uh, it'll be a battle of... Anybody uh, going? You! There you go. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. All right. You know, there's an easy one right there coming back with the playoffs last year. In our first in our first year, we beat you guys. Um, I mean, seriously, guys. Yeah. What these guys did last year was amazing. Amazing. And, and it wasn't even as close as the 4-2 uh, number of games. So, um, but, uh, but anyway, that's a small piece of it. And I think for us, it really starts with how we brand the organization. We're Vegas born. And what that means is um, we're very much focused on the local Las Vegas marketplace. Uh, there's 2.3 million people that actually live in Las Vegas. A lot of people think there's this four mile strip and everybody that lives on the strip. Well, that's not true. Uh, I live in Summerlin. It's a suburb about 20 minutes outside of uh, the strip area. And uh, we have restaurants and churches and all the other things that all the other cities and communities <laughs> have. Uh, but that really is our market. And uh, we work extremely hard. And uh, again, if you come out to the game tomorrow night, I think what you'll see is in a year and a half, uh, and I'm really proud of our organization, it is one of the most, we went from the, you know, if you think about the marketing fund, you think about awareness, we went all the way to advocacy and to conviction in a year and a half. And it's not just the 90% of the fans that have our gear on at the games. It's not just one hat or one jersey, it's multiple items. Um, and they really feel and live the brand. And uh, we're really proud of it because we are Vegas born. And ultimately to make this thing work long term, um, we've got to build this thing from within. And that's really where all of our focus is. And it's not just on the typical NHL audience. Uh, we're really looking and working closely with the NHL on diversity. And we really believe we can build the game. Half our market, don't, they don't look like me. Half our market is, uh, is made, you know, when you look at the Asian community, when you look at the African American community, when you look at the Hispanic community, that's 50% of the 2.3 million people that live here. And uh, we've got to really work hard. And I think we've done a phenomenal job. I, I believe we're already on the path 
for the most diverse NHL team in the league, and I'm really proud of that. It's great. I mean, you've really been embraced by the city in a way that I think you guys may be expected, but I think a lot of, took a lot of folks by surprise. Yeah, because, I, again, I think it gets back to that perception that we were just going to be filled with, uh, you know, people that can't, those 43 million people. Right. And, you know, again, nothing against the great events that happen on the Strip. They're fantastic, but that's what those are designed for. And uh, we have a separate uh, vision and focus with Vegas born. I love it. I love it. Um, Zach, so as you guys think about fans, how do you, how do you at Wasserman think about fans and defining them? I, I'm also interested also specifically more broadly, but then also as athletes, like the athletes you represent, how do they think about their fans and what, what the, who those people are? Yeah, no, I, I think you guys hear a lot of great stuff from the people up on the stage. And one of the words that comes to mind, I heard a couple times, is this ecosystem. Um, properties, talent, brands, right? They, they all are creating this ecosystem. And anyone that engages with them within that ecosystem, we define as a fan. So strictly from a property standpoint, whether that's engaging you know, at the arena or on the own social channels or website channels or just through earned media because the Knights make amazing content that goes elsewhere, they're all fans. Um, Carrie mentioned, you know, just down the strip, anywhere within Vegas. Uh, Amy was saying all tennis fans, they're all within that ecosystem. So to us, like, it really is thinking of fans of anyone within that ecosystem where we have a touch point where a property or brand talent can engage. And from an athlete side, we represent, I think, about 1,600, 1600 athletes right now worldwide. They all have their own platform. So they are their own brand and now are creating they are a production studio making short form, long form content. They are doing more with their own camps or fundraising or other type of charitable organizations. And they are kind of creating fans across the board that do are, are fans that engage with them and follow them and are motivated by them way beyond just what happens on the court or on the field. It's for all of these things. And so we kind of take those same methodology or just framework of let's understand our ecosystem. Let's make sure we understand the different types of people within it and how we can kind of meet them and engage with them in the manner that they want to be. Like, that's kind of how we approach NFAN, and that varies, you know, huge variance mm -hmm. between a team like the Las Vegas Knights to an upcoming uh, Olympic athlete that can only do something in a certain window and may only have relevance for a short period of time to someone like Russell Westbrook, who has the opportunity to do tons of things, but, you know, is of a mindset of everything on the court comes first, um, also amazing off the court, but it, it, there is a ranked priority, and that can change from athlete and, and brand and property themselves. I forgot you guys did Russell Westbrook. I'm now disappointed in your garb today. So, <laughs> oh, you're not. Ru Russell I mean, this, not this is approved. Ted Baker head to toe. I think this <laughs> yeah. is just uh, more normal. I like how it. about that. <laughs> but how do you guys think about? It? I mean, I think one of the really interesting sort of, and I don't know, maybe tension, maybe not, that exists is there is the athlete has fans, the team has yeah. fans. How do, how do you meet in the middle there? How do you share that? How do you share that responsibility, share that relationship? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I can start with love carrying others' perspective to chime in here. I think ultimately it's around aligning on what are the shared goals. Uh, everyone's trying to deliver the best experience to the fans, to our overall fans as possible. And if we are being authentic to ourselves or property, some clubs and athletes allow for more access. They will give more of their time. Uh, Jared Dudley, uh, fellow San Diegan, um, kind of grew up similar type high schools. He's one of the most engaging players on Twitter all the time after his games, and he rarely plays on, on the Nets. Actually, he contributes. I take that back. He's a good vet contributing on them, but he gives a lot of his personal time of just engaging all the time. Um, and it, he's not trying to monetize. That's just him. So one that you can tap into from a club is like, okay, we, we have access. He is fun, has a good personality. How can we work together to do something fun to really engage our fans, deliver on those experiences? And then if it is something where an athlete's like, all right, I'm going to go build our own production studio and we are going to make long form movies or short form, just making sure that you're aligning with your team or club and working in concert to be more effective where it makes sense and otherwise kind of work around it. Like you have a calendar of events and some initiatives probably should happen in the off season and you don't want it to take away from the on court or on field performance because that would have an adverse effect. And, you know, obviously they have a contract with the club and the team and they want to be great partners. And I think, you know, the more transparency and creativity together, the better I can tell from an agency side, like athletes are expecting more. It's not just, Hey, help us sign our contract, great to get a great deal. It's what else are we doing? Are we making our own production studio? Can I go compete at Ryan and play some League of Legends and have some fun? You know, where does it make sense? But, you know, we have a lot of great agents that do that, but that's kind of our, our approach for it. Mm -hmm. 
Terry, is that Terry, kind of aligned with how or... you guys work with some of your talent? Well, I, I think just to, to kind of add on to it, I, you know, culturally the NHL, uh, unlike the NBA, um, because the team component is such a, uh, again, it, it, it's, they kind of grow up with it. And the minute someone kind of tries to step outside of the team, they get reined back in. Right. And ultimately, you know, that's, I, I worked in the NBA for 13 years and uh, Cleveland, uh, you know, we had LeBron James and you think about Russell Westbrook and the, these are mega personalities that have tremendous uh, interest and in, 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 in people following them through all the different social channels. Um, but that hasn't been there with the NHL. And I think what the league is trying to do is really encourage teams because there's, there's no doubt that there's a connection between um, the visibility of our players mm -hmm. and the growth of our league. And we're trying to build this game and build this league. And uh, so what we've tried to do, at least at the, uh, you know, here in Las Vegas with the Golden Knights is, uh, first of all, make sure we're aligned with the hockey side of our organization and what we want to do. Um, but we want to be the most accessible uh, organization in sports or in the National Hockey League. And that really gets back to a culture with our players and their visibility and their availability. Um, because we believe that, that that access, that authenticity, um, really is going to bring their personalities to life. And so uh, there's just so many examples um, you know, through that authenticity where, it, where we're able to just take advantage of opportunities that are happening um, you know, on a more on a real-time basis. And uh, one of the quick stories is last year, uh, one of our players, it was, uh, it was probably March, so it's pretty late in the season, and he's being quoted after the game, and he says, you know, we're all a bunch of golden misfits. <laughs> and they were talking about the expansion draft and the fact that each player came from uh, all of these other different uh, you know, cities around the NHL, and they were kind of just brought together, and, they, and magic happened. And uh, Las Vegas is a lot like that. There's a lot of people from other places that come together uh, here in Las Vegas. And so, you know, immediately it's like, how do we take advantage of that opportunity? And so, you know, whether it be in terms of socially, how do we start to like own that Golden Misfits? And then uh, from a retail perspective and every aspect of our business, but literally within a couple of days, we were able to react um, and have it live and breathe in every aspect of our business. And it really became um, something that uh, really carried forward as we went through uh, throughout the playoffs and beating San Jose. And uh, <laughs> so, but anyway, it was- uh, Gonna say, that knife is in now and now it's <laughs> twisted. So yeah, yeah. Um, but really, I think it gets back to, we, we've got to get our players uh, more comfortable with stepping outside and being more visible. And uh, the great news is the NHL really sees that opportunity. And I think you'll see more and more of that uh, as we go forward, um, you know, during the Stanley Cup, Ovechkin after it was over. I mean, everything that I saw socially was him with the cup, drinking somewhere in, uh, you know, throughout the world. Yeah. And I, I just thought it was fantastic. Love so. it. I, I would add, um, yeah. you know, the USTA has uh, an interesting um, scenario because we don't own any of our players. Either. Right, it's you very know, different. Individual um, kind of tennis um, entities, and we partner with them to, you know, help them curate their own social channels, um, and then we uh, create original content to engage fans. Uh, for example, we did a great promotion with Del Potro where he spoke to an astronaut in space, um, and he wished him a, you know, very, a good luck at the US Open, and then we had the first tennis space match, and that was a way to get the audience a little more excited about tennis. Um, and you know, we worked with the Bryan brothers, uh, who are you know, doubles players, if you don't know, and you know, we put a GoPro um, on you know, the rack Brackets, um, as well as um, on the court um, and you know did original content like that so you know our approach with players is that they're also looking for original content to grow their audiences mm -hmm. so we have that shared goal and it's worked really well for us love it, it did anyone else wonder who won the space match <laughs> that was the first that was the first thing in my head did anyone win or um, no. Okay, gotcha. But they did have tiny little rackets that you know, I had an embargo and you know put into space like a year before. That's awesome. Nice. Kind of interesting. Chuck, are you going to say something or? <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because I think from being the the league operator in esports, we almost have the reverse problem that I've I've heard described here, which is that our players are almost more accessible than in some ways even the teams want them to be. Yep. A lot of our pros became known and became popular through streaming on Twitch. And so, you know, they're spending six, eight, ten hours a day directly responding to fans. And I mean, you think about 
LeBron practicing or putting up jumpers. Like he's never going to be addressing his fans when he's doing that. He's going to yep. be focused on the craft. These guys are focusing on their practice craft while interacting with their community in, in you know, incredible amounts. And so for us, when we started putting together the league, we found that the overwhelming fandom focus was on players. No one actually cared about teams. They followed players where they went, and we could literally see fandom shifts of, okay, this team has 30% share, then they lost a, a starter, and now 20% went from here to here. And so, so for us, what we've been trying to, to do uh, now that we've franchised in the league and have these permanent team brands is find ways to develop those teams and actually enhance the team side of telling the story okay. because teams before never had a story. They were, they were shirts. Yeah. You know, they were shirts, and they had sponsors, and they were financial entities. But they never told stories. They never interacted with the fans because that was the player's role. And that was so cemented it's within the space. Yeah, yeah, just that, that switch. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, so let's shift gears slightly. So, so we've talked about who our fans are, right? Let's talk a little bit about how do we engage them? What are they looking for? What is it that fans want from you um, as brands, as properties, as, as, as teams, as leagues? What are they looking for? And, and how, do you, how do you engage them when they do that? So I don't know, Scarpy, if you want to talk a little bit about, as you think about um, those customers, those guests, yeah. you know, including fans, but more broadly in the district, how do you think about engaging them? How do you think about building relationships with them? Yeah, I, I think it, it, you know, for us, it, there's two things, right? I think more and more, and certainly this comes with, uh, with m m the younger generation uh, and their expectations about just, you know, experience, right? It's not just a sporting event, right, where there are, you know, the, uh, a score is being kept, mm -hmm. right? It is, it's everything that in, encapsulates that. It is, it's the, it's the sort of shared community, it's the shared experience. I think it's part of what, what the Knights have just, you know, absolutely nailed, right? There, there's this identity, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think for us, we are trying to figure out how to sort of amplify that experience, right? We have the advantage, if you will, in our project to have uh, a lot of different things for our fans to do when they're on site, right? So how do we engage them early? How do we get them to show up early and stay late? And so I would say that our, our strategy, if you will, for fan engagement is really curb to curb to curb, mm -hmm. right? And sort of how we, um, how we uh, promote and, and sort of engage them across everything that we have to offer, right? I mean, I, I would think that's an interesting challenge for you because it's not just a stadium, right? It's Correct. Sta in some ways, you are a stadium operator, you're a real estate developer, you're, you're creating all sorts of types of experiences, and you've got to figure out how to blend all those together. Yeah, no, a absolutely. And, and so we are looking, we're looking at where that's been successful, sort of coming, coming from Disney. They're, they are certainly the gold standard in a lot of that. Um, and, and I guess one of the things that we're, if you want to hone in on it, we're trying to figure out what's the sports and entertainment version of that. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. What does that look like? I know, Zach, what do you think? What are fans actually looking for? Uh, uh, any for fans of the movie Gladiator? I'm just going to be the only fan. A couple. All right. I'm going to drop a movie line. Uh, so one of my favorite lines from the movie, and it's applicable here, is uh, the Russell Crowe. He's being talked to right before he's about to battle in the arena. And, and Proximo tells him, you know, win the crowd and win your freedom. I think in sports business, it, win the crowd and you're going to be successful. You're going to win in sports business. But winning the crowd um, and engaging the crowd, you know, back in ancient Rome, was just those in the arena. Right now, it's those that come to the game. It's those that are watching at home. It's those that are on social. It's those that have VR, like this gentleman right here um, <laughs> looking at us. AR, I'm sorry. There's cool. AR as well. There's OTT. There's the touch points. All these different places, right? And all those different crowds and audiences, they have different affinities, they have different motivations, they have different likes, they want to be communicated in a different way. Uh, and, and so it's about meeting them in that fashion and kind of understanding that they are different groups. You know, it sounds super complicated, um, and it can be, but the beauty is there's an abundance of data, right? There's a tremendous amount of data about all those different people, all those different touch points that we can kind of combine and pull through some insights that will allow us to deliver these additive and personalized experience for each segment. So like at a macro overall level, when we're working with any client, big or small, you know, if we're thinking about fan engagement strategy, it is really about elevating that experience that's specific to that audience segment 
Um, and you know, it can be as simple as something like improved parking, which is more from an efficiency standpoint. Or it can be something like amazing content that I'm engaging with before or after, and that's more of the experience. So that's kind of how we, we think about it, where it always is kind of additive and, and more personalized, but really starting with understanding who our fans are, who those different segments are, what they like, and kind of aligning our, our strategy to meet that. So a, a lot of numbers up front, but really kind of pulling through insights and, and then taking action. Yep. Amy, so how do you think about engagement? How do you think about both that engagement at the open, right? So for the three weeks of that event, uh, as well as more broadly, the, the 40 million plus. You know, the U.S. Open, you know, as you said, is a three-week event, um, but I'm going to do my plug now. Yeah, there you okay. go, 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 go. <laughs> From main draw, it's actually a two-week event, but the, the first week is actually qualifying, um, which we call Fan Week, but it's the largest uh, secret, I think, in the industry in that it's free, and uh, you can, you know, go there and actually see uh, a Roger or Serena uh, for free uh, playing and practicing as well as the qualifying tournament. Um, and we are positioning the tournament as a three-week event in which you could come there in a premium way to um, experience tennis, experience you know the, the best um, you know dining and retail um, and you know beverages, and it's um, you know it, it, there's actually nothing like being there, um, especially leveraging what we're doing with our sponsors and the sponsor activation, and a lot of them is really getting people engaged in tennis as well and getting rackets in people's hands uh, for them to experience it, whether it's you know through um, you know VR and um, you know people having a, the feel of being on. You know, a professional tennis court, um, or actually, you know, getting them in touch um, through our digital properties uh, with providers. You know, you know, that's it's it's a broader story that we're trying to tell. I love it. You want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, youth as well, in terms of how you think about youth and engaging youth? No, absolutely. Um, you know. The USTA is um, obviously the national governing um, of body of tennis, and as we look at the future of tennis, you know, the biggest audience that we're trying to engage is our youth, and um, Net Generation is a new brand that we've launched, which is our official youth tennis brand, um, and we, through the Open, have actually introduced it in a very unique way, where um, Net Generation kids um, are doing all the coin tosses um, on, um, you know, every single champion in court. Um, they're playing on the court and we have a national contest to be involved in coming to play on Arthur Ashe Stadium. Anybody um, have any kids who play tennis? No? A couple? Yeah. Got a, yeah. Hopefully you will have kids that play tennis yeah, after yeah, I'm talking, that. if I'm doing my job right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, you know, and if, if, if you're like me, I learned how to play tennis on a large size court with a yellow ball with a normal size racket, and it's a much more obtainable sport now, where it's um, smaller um, racket sizes, uh, a progression of balls um, that are um, different compression sizes, um, as well as smaller courts. Um, so there's an education factor in that, in that as well. Love it. Love it. How about you guys, Chopper? I mean, I, again, I imagine it's it's very different. In some ways, probably much the same as some of the other challenges, but in some ways, very different, just given the the nature of what you guys do. Yeah, you know, it's it's easy when we when we started that we kind of naturally started focusing on the live event experience because that sort of felt the most dissimilar from what we did in terms of putting on the broadcast. Um, but then we sort of caught up and started thinking about it, and we said, okay, at our recent World Championships, we had forty five thousand people in the stadium in in Korea but we had 99.6 million people watching online. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, okay, well, now we've got to kind of shift our thinking and think a lot more about the digital experience and, and kind of facilitating fans there. And what we realized as we did a lot of segmentation studies and really kind of dove into the fan base was that fans wanted different things out of the show. And so what we tried to do is create different offerings that tend to those, to those different preferences. Some fans want to watch esports because they want to get better at League of Legends. Some fans want to watch League of Legends just because it's the mastery of the game that they love being put on display. Some people just want a great social experience that they can share with their friends. And so what we have to do is kind of curate the central experience in a way that still can be appealing to all, but create these sort of offshoot experiences, you know, whether that be shoulder content or different engagement channels or, you know, finding ways to connect the community around the event, um, you know, that allow for these differing means of engagement. Because at the end of the day, a lot of these people want very different things and we want to serve all of them. And so, you know, trying to find the best way to reach out to those 99.6 million 
uh, can be pretty tricky, but that's sort of the, the, the branching paths that we're exploring now. I think it's fascinating too, because I, again, in some ways, you know, a, a lot of traditional sports, are, you know, are, are broadcast over linear channels and and are you know relatively uh, structured in terms of one type of broadcast. Whereas what you guys have with Twitch and other faces, you can create multiple different. I'll call them broadcasts. How do you guys yeah. think about that? And how do you think about producing content at the same time for varying different types of audiences? Yeah, you know, I mean, there, there's obviously always going to be the base product, which is sort of the core broadcast. But a lot of what we think about is the surrounding content that people want to consume during the broadcast. And so, you know, we refer to the second screen experience a lot. And for some people, that's literally their second monitor as they're watching at their home PC station. For some of them, that's their iPad or their phone as they're watching. And so what we've done is we've developed some different stats platforms so you can learn more about what's going on kind of at a deeper level within the game. Uh, we've tried to develop out some fantasy and pick them and kind of other just entertainment avenues to kind of surround the gaming experience. Um, and then we want to make sure that we're still filling the time when the games aren't live. Mm -hmm. You know, we're running in North America, we run our games for five hours on Saturdays and Sundays, but we're putting out probably another eight to 12 hours of live content after that during the week as kind of a means of continual engagement throughout. So, you know, we want to make sure that, that the core broadcast is always the, the focal point because at the end of the day, the competition is what's going to drive the fans and, and bring them back. That mastery is what's so important. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're able to develop that surrounding program, whether it be, you know, more fun, more educational, more communal, um, and really just kind of build out those experiences wherever they need to be. Mm -hmm. How about you guys, Carrie? I mean, we are in the city of experiences, right? <laughs> How do we think about yes, we producing are. sports content for, and creating, you know, a, an experience here in this city? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's it's a, it's a lot of things, but uh, the first thing that I was thinking about was just um, how difficult it is to define engagement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's not, because uh, we, you know, Zach was talking about the different tools that you utilize to profile, and, and we do all of that. Mm -hmm. But to me, it's really more about the culture of your organization mm -hmm. as it relates to fan engagement. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so what I mean by that is last year, uh, you know, as this thing was, you gotta understand where we are in our life cycle, and we're so early as an organization, and uh, some of it was just by just happening. It wasn't like this strategic vision and plan and everything that we you're did. Supposed, you're supposed to take credit for all of it. No. Come on, it was all, <laughs> it, it was all your it, brainchild. There, so. there was, and certainly there was planning, but I, yeah. my point is, so we get to the playoffs last year, and, and obviously at some point we were like, well, we are gonna make the playoffs. And, uh, and it's like, okay. And the, the appetite for everything that we did, every place that we took our brand, and it didn't matter wherever we took it, either physically, socially, digitally, wherever we took it, people were asking for more. Mm. And so uh, you know, then we started internal email chains with our leadership team, and it was like, well, let's feed the beast. The beast is hungry. And so it became a fun thing within our organization because the beast was really describing the enthusiasm of our fans. Huh. And it's like, and it really became a, a mantra within that playoff run. How are we going to keep feeding this beast? And uh, again, every aspect of it. And so from the game presentation, you know, like it doesn't just start with the game, right? Has anybody ever, the folks who've been to a Vegas Knights game, it, the, the game itself is wonderful and is awesome, but it is very Vegas around the game as well. It's better it than the Gladiator movie itself. Yeah. <laughs> the first 12 minutes. Yeah, and, it, and, it, and in a lot of ways, it, it like to a brand and a marketing person, would, it wouldn't make sense to them. It'd be like, well, this is ridiculous. But that's what makes it so great is because it, it is borderline ridiculous. And yes, it connects with the, the brand of the Golden Knight and, and what the Knight represents and you know defend those that can't defend themselves and all of that. But um, it, it borderline, it's borderline ridiculous. But you know what? Isn't that kind of what Las Vegas yeah, is? I mean, it's amazing. I mean, when yeah. you really, when yeah. you think about it, you come here to kind of step out of what you are, wherever you are, yeah, yeah, yeah. and live a little bit, you know, the, the, forever, the big ad agency here, uh, what, you know, what happens in Vegas stays. Yep. I mean, this is like one I've of the best taglines of all time. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, I, I think there's an element of that, but it really gets, you know, I, I just think it's really hard to define. And to me, it's more about a culture of, of how you engage with your fans. And I'm really proud of, again, that feed the beast because we try to have, uh, we just try to have fun with that. And whatever that idea is, if it's feeding that beast and it doesn't always have to be revenue based, mm -hmm. um, then we're gonna do it. And, uh, and people have a lot of freedom to create ideas to help feed the beast. How much do you think it was an advantage that this was 
your first year. I mean, that, that, I mean, you had a lot of executives like yourselves who'd been around the industry for a long time, but this was really the first time that this group of people had ever gone through a season, Never mind playoffs and everything that went with it and all those things. How much was that an advantage? I, I think it was a huge advantage because we didn't uh, think about hockey. It's a very traditional sport, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's good things about that, but I also think there's other ways that that can be a negative. And so we didn't have any traditions. All we had was an expectation of a marketplace. That is, this is the entertainment capital of the world. And if we're going to compete mm -hmm. and succeed and be viable on a long-term basis, then we have to at least play at that level, if not better, with our entertainment experience. Because what we didn't know is that people would also fall in love with this great game the mm -hmm. way they have. And in some instances, they knew nothing about hockey. And others, maybe they moved here from Boston or Philadelphia, and they had a hockey background, but now they're Golden Knights fans. Yeah. Um, but we didn't know. So we had to put a lot of focus and effort on our entertainment experience um, so we could ultimately, uh, you know, again, try and meet the expectation of the, uh, you know, of the marketplace. And, and like I said, I feel like we've, feel like we've done that. It's been great. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a fun show and it's one we're real. Uh, Everybody should go see it. We're real proud of, but again, we don't have those traditions. So we can, my, part of my point was we're going to be able to create our own traditions. I love it. Yeah. And yeah. so some of our traditions are, um, we, last year we were playing Winnipeg and their fans real loud during the Canadian anthem said, true north. Uh -huh. Those two words, true north. And next thing you know, our fans, when they got to the American anthem, it started with a few people saying, night during that, you know, that particular word in the national anthem, during the U.S. anthem. And now it's maybe the most significant, and if you've never been to our game, it kind of catches you off guard because you got literally 18,000 people screaming night at that at moment during the national anthem. At the same time, that's one of our new traditions. Your fans do it at away games too. I was at the Kings game on the 29th, and in the middle of the national anthem, nights, huge section. Yeah, Good so traveling our, crowd. our fans are traveling, um, and so that becomes our tradition. Our warm-ups, typically that had been more of a, got some music, guys come out, they skate around, they're, they're warming up, they're getting focused. Ours is a rock concert. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, like, it's like going out to any of the establishments at two in the morning, right. and it's thumping, the music's loud, the lights are flashing, and that's our experience, yeah. but that's our tradition. Our warm-ups are different and unique, and uh, and so we're able to build our own traditions, and it's it's just been so much fun. I, I feel like I need to ask Zach about establishments at two in the morning, but maybe we'll do that later. Uh, yeah. I thought we were going. Why don't we talk a little bit about, so Zach, how do you guys think about, I mean, we are at CES, right? We are talking about technology mm -hmm. in the different ways. You know, how do we think about technology and 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 building these relationships with fans and understanding fans, and and how do we use it, and how what, what, what are we doing these days uh, in that space? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone up here and even in the crowd can say there's, there's an overwhelming amount of new tech or new data that's at the fingertips um, and it's all fantastic because it can be you know utilized in the right way to really engage with people in the right manner um, but I, I think what Carrie just said and, and something is so true is it has to be authentic it has to be authentic to who you are as a property and who you are as a fan and, and not try and be you know everything to everyone at once so even if you have all these tools, um, and I'm going to talk about one in a second, but like you got to keep in mind authenticity, story, and creativity. I, I truly think like we used your we use your opening um, sequence at your games as a best in class example when we're working with other teams and leagues and call it out for the absurdity that is Vegas, and it's so you. I don't think other clubs could pull that off, but it's perfect for everything that you guys have as Vegas because it taps into everything of the culture, right? And it's super important. And I do think there are tools that if you, you go with them and in real time, not like trend data anymore. So one of the ones that we like to use a lot, um, it, it's a product we built, but it's called Unlock and it leverages about 300 million plus profiles on the social sphere, looking at 320 variables that are all deep psychographics, affinity, attitudinal behavior characteristics. So it looks at what people are talking about, but like who they're engaging with, what content they are posting themselves, where they're from. It's, it works in image rec plus some text. And so kind of really tells us of these various audience groups and we can do it for this room. We can do it for just locals of Vegas. We could do it for, you know, hockey fans in New York and we can rack and stack all the data points like a Venn diagram, a glorified Venn diagram, see where there's overlap see where there's a gap. And from that, we can say, okay, everyone likes these three things. These segments only like this and this. This segment likes wide. We don't have it. What can we do to go bring that in? So we kind of use the tools to look at them and then kind of come up with the insights to go 
find people that are super creative or we then brainstorm ourselves to come up with ideas like Carrie has for you know, the start of their game. So we, we right now are really using tech all the time and in real time and kind of focus on that real time nature of just people share everything about themselves. I mean, they're, they're happy to give you information or email to get free Wi-Fi in this room or to get Wi-Fi at the stadium. You know, digital and mobile ticketing. I, I happily will give you a lot where it automatically just shows up my phone. I can pass it off to any of my friends when I don't use my season tickets. I mean, w gone are the days of, no, I'm not giving you an email when you ask. Everyone will just toss it out there. So we do have all these data points, but it's about kind of sifting through and, and making sense of them. So that's where we spend a lot of time, but then you have to keep that through line of authenticity, story, and creativity to, because it needs to kind of tap into the culture, like Harry is saying, create that emotional reaction. Yeah. Scarpy, I, know, I mean, I know a big part of what your, your plans with the district and with um, Hollywood Park are around technology. How are you thinking about how technology is going to help you uh, create an experience for you to understand you know, the needs of those fans and those customers who come through that? Yeah, I, it, there's a couple of things in there, right? There is, there is, you know, how we think about basically the intersection of our guest with the physical environment, right? Mm -hmm. Wherever there's a touch point, if you will, um, a great example of that could be, you know, uh, going through the gate, right? Uh, handing over your ticket, so to speak, getting it scanned. What is the application of technology at those touch points to make that interaction easier or uh, more frictionless or even, you know, a little bit more exciting, right? And, and I think the interesting thing about being, building this sort of mega stadium at this time is these waves of technology that have just hit us or are about to hit us. And there's two things that we have to do is how do we accommodate them? Mm -hmm. Maybe even when the building wasn't designed for them, but we know where it's going. Um, and uh, and how, how do we think it's going to advantage us? And, mm -hmm. and it's sort of, it's, it's really interesting how it cascades because you start thinking about, and if you guys have gone to the, the show floor or even outside, like autonomous driving is everywhere, right? And that's actually something as designers of these physical spaces, we have to now account for uh, because we know it's coming. But when, you know, four, um, uh, three, four years ago, when, when the space was designed, that wasn't necessarily kept in mind, right? Uh, 5G is another great example, right? It is, it is not just what the experience is to the user, but how do you actually accommodate all of the infrastructure that's needed for 5G. Because if you, if you know 5G, the, the, it's a very different technology at the millimeter wave than the current, um, the current wireless standards, right? And so, so it becomes um, tricky, if you will. Uh, and my point has always been, or certainly going through this for the last year and a half, is that as these buildings get built uh, or designed even from the very, very beginning, um, you have to start accommodating the technology infrastructure uh, that's needed and, and basically what is demanded by our guests mm -hmm. um, to improve that experience, right? And, and how do you build in that flexibility? Like, you, I mean, it's one thing to say you plan for it, but how do you, how do you, yeah. how do you accommodate? Well, so, I mean, traditionally what you do is you design the physical space and then technologies are overlaid on top of it. The problem we have right now is the technologies are certainly in wireless are getting so dense, mm. right? That you just, it's very hard to accommodate it all. So, so much like when you're in the design phase and you want to accommodate, you know, HVAC or, you know, plumbing, right? Which right. is, we've been doing for, you know, forever. We now have to start thinking about how do we accommodate all the technology? Yeah. Sort of not as an overlay on top of the building, but literally integrated into it. Well, and as a like design those. parameter, yeah. right? I mean, in, in a lot of ways, um, you know, the, we, we think of technology as Wi-Fi and, and tablets and displays, but you know, you've got to think about technology as rideshare, mm -hmm. right? As yeah. you know, Elon Musk boring a tunnel, right? Yeah, yeah. right. Things like that. So I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I mean, it it's it's starting to cascade ev into everything, even things that that you sort of take for granted, like payment technology, and how you check out. For merchandising and food and beverage, you know the, the the fact that you know the the old point of sale is sort of getting you know is getting devalued, right? It's getting old-fashioned, and that the mobile phone and and 
and uh, sort of Amazon Go-like uh, uh, sort of seamless checkout is the, is the wave of the future. And this, by the way, cascades into how we design those spaces, right? Um, so it's, 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 uh, it's very interesting time. How about you, Amy? How do you guys think about technology? How do you guys take, use technology to understand tennis fans? Well, um, yeah, we, we, uh, Zach spoke quickly about mobile ticketing, and that uh, we launched about two years ago. Um, the first, the first year, um, you know, obviously was a huge learning experience. Um, the second year, we, we know much more about our ticket holders now, and um, the digital infrastructure that we've been building from a data standpoint. You know, eventually we're going to be able to connect you know, people that are coming through our gates with um, the information if they're playing tennis and if their kids are playing tennis, and then using technology to personalize um, their experience for them. Um, when you're on the property, um, we just relaunched our digital properties um, with IBM uh, for the .org and the mobile, and we have some great um, innovative um, ways that we're using technology on the mobile app uh, to allow people to have an interactive grounds pass um, that will allow you to see you know, real-time scoring of you know, all of our courts. We have about 20 courts, um, and then our championship courts, um, as you know, eventually uh, something we're working on is integrating wait times. Um, to get on a court or wait times at the concession stands. So I think it'll be a, a huge role for us moving forward, yep. um, which we're incredibly excited about. Uh, I'm curious, because a lot of folks, you know, digital ticketing is starting to become the norm. I'm yep. curious, what do you guys hope to do with that information that, you, that you're collecting as part of that? What is, what's the plan for using that and to, to continue to build relationships? Uh, making their experience, um, you know, in their seat, um, you know, the best possible. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's a surprise and delight uh, seat up upgrade, um, or um, you know, giving them information about the court, the the match that they're watching right then and there, um, as well as information of the players that they have followed as their favorites, um, and to give them um, access. Uh, to you know all of the content that's happening both on the courts um, as well as off the courts and you know I can even see a future where we're having you know people in the stadium with their mobile devices help us curate and develop content to then broadcast out through our channels and making them the co-creators themselves yep I love it I I have to acknowledge the absurdity of this question, Chopper, all right? Because I'm about to ask you the question, how do you think about using technology to engage your fan base? So, it doesn't. Uh, it's, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's an afterthought. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, Takes my notebook. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, technology is obviously core to, to what we do from, you know, it, it literally defines the playing space of our athletes. Um, we actually just announced yesterday with, with Dell Alien, where a massive partnership with them to have that be sort of the official um, PC and, and uh, monitor provider. So we're really excited about that space and really kind of developing further the bounds of increasing the athletic performance through technology. So you know, even things as simple as increasing the refresh rate on monitors and, and working with them to understand what enhances their performance is, is sort of one avenue that we go down. But for me, when I think about specifically fans, um, the key for us has always been trying to unite the behavior of our viewer with the behavior of a League of Legends player. And historically, those were two closed systems because when they went to view, they did so on a platform that wasn't ours. They did it on Twitch or on YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, you know, ESPN Plus, et cetera. And when they played, obviously, they played through our client. Yep. And so what, what we always wanted to know was, well, what's the impact? You know, is watching esports actually cannibalizing playtime? Is it enhancing playtime? Does it shift their play preferences? You know, there's a ton of very important business decisions so we can take if we know better the combined actions of those individuals. And so what we had to create was reasons for those systems to overlap, mm -hmm. reasons for those ecosystems to connect. And so what we started doing was we started providing viewer rewards based on, uh, for your League of Legends account, based on viewing on those different platforms. So you go onto Twitch and you can now connect your Twitch account with your Riot account. And if you watch for a certain amount, you get credited in the game oh, wow. with, with certain rewards. And so what that did was it now created this database of people who we know they play like this and they watch like this. And so, you know, we're going through that data set now, but, but what we hope to, to kind of glean from that is understanding a lot more about who our key esports, you know, player base is. Because as much as we, you know, we're thrilled to have, you know, 99.6 million people tune in for the world championships, we have over 100 million monthly uniques. Right. And when you think about the people that have played League of Legends at some point over the last 10 years, you know, you're now talking about hundreds of millions of people that could potentially be a fan of League of Legends esports. 
And so when I think about the size of that pie, I want to know more about how to go after that. And so yeah. if there's elements of cross promotion we can do that'll you know enhance the performance of certain business applications within league, if there's things that we can do on the league side to promote the esport, you know we're really excited to kind of delve into this new combined data set that we have and really kind of try and uh, you know glean a lot of learnings about who our fans are, how they play, and and how those worlds interact. So what is the answer? Does one cannibalize the other? Have we figured it out yet? So. Or? Historically, what we found is that the the actions of the player are somewhat separated from the actions of the viewer. There tends to be correlations, uh, especially in certain regions, around the types of games they play. So, um, you know, in certain regions, esports viewers will tend to play more ranked rather than casual. Um, and in certain regions, they tend to play more ARAMs, which is sort of our fun mode. And yeah, so that yeah, yeah. that sort of changes based on just regional preference in some cases. But, you know, what we've increasingly found is that the the, the wallet of time for play is different than the wallet of time for view. Mm. And that was actually a really reassuring find for us because we were really worried that we were gonna be cannibalizing play time. Um, and so what we've tried to do in that case then is make the eSport easier to watch because if we know that their view, their wallet of time for viewing is separate, we can then pursue that in a different fashion. We don't necessarily have to make it as complimentary to the game and be like, play a game and then watch a game to get better at your champion. We right. can you know, tailor it a little bit differently. And so you know, that's led to you know, big decisions like going from a best of three model to a best of one model where you know, we had last year, we were playing three games per match and now we're only playing one game per match. So we've drastically kind of cut down the amount of content that we're producing, but we're focusing in on it and trying to provide a much more concentrated product for the fans. So there's been a lot of really kind of interesting findings that have come out of it, but we're, we're just at the forefront of yeah. kind of figuring that but, out. And but I, that I mean, I love it what you guys are doing. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys. I mean, I, I, working with a lot of traditional sports organizations, to be able to even ask that type of question you know, yeah. is, is, is in a lot of ways a luxury that you guys have. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious if, similar to Amy's point earlier, of all tennis fans are fans. Do you go and like anyone that games as a potential fan that you're trying to acquire, nurture, convert into I, I, LL? I mean, that's, that's kind of my philosophy is that anybody who is open to gaming as something that they make time for, something that you know they make as a priority in their life, I can see them being a fan of esports. Now for some of those people, it's a longer path, right? right. It's a much easier path to convert a fan of Dota, which is you know a, a similar genre that has an esports similar to ours. It's gonna be a lot easier to convert them to be a fan of League of Legends. It's gonna be marginally harder to convert an Overwatch fan mm -hmm. because they're a fan of, of first person shooters and there's some difficulties in breaching genre boundaries. It's gonna be even more difficult to kind of get the person who's just a mobile, mm -hmm. uh, like a mobile user. But at the end of the day, it's just, for me, it's just a matter of time because every day that goes by, the number of individuals who grew up with consoles in their house, the number of people who grew up with gaming as this sort of ubiquitous form of entertainment and are much more accustomed to that being part of their society, that percentage of the population is increasing. So for me, it's kind of like time is on our side. Yep. And so I don't, we, we look at it as the percentage of the population growing kids is thing. So it's less that we kind of look at are they in, are they out of the right. pie? And it's more that we just know that the addressable audience is so huge we're that we're just gonna continue to put out the best product that we can and, and do what we can to kind of convert where, where possible. Love it. What would you guys carry? How do you guys think about technology and, and, and engaging your fans? Yeah, I, I, just a couple of examples. Uh, you know, much like Amy, we have a digital platform for all tickets. So that is our only method of entry into our venue. It's primarily mobile, mm -hmm. uh, not exclusively um, through our ticketing system with access. Uh, the data and how it allows us to be more focused, more efficient, uh, more targeted with our, uh, you know, with our membership and our activation team, uh, and how we manage those accounts. Uh, certainly more sophisticated in terms of pricing and how we look at uh, the secondary marketplace. We've actually launched our own secondary marketplace called VGK Ticket Exchange. Anybody wants to go to the game tomorrow night? So. You can go there and find some uh, seat <laughs> options. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of those. Again, I like to talk about the stuff that, you know, where does technology cross uh, and be entertaining and help yep. feed the beast? Yep. And uh, one of the more recent examples, um, last year there were just so many firsts, right? That was our first year, it was unbelievable. There was just like one incredible first after another. And to feed that beast, we actually uh, created a book. And it's a, it's a coffee table type book that's really more image oriented. So it's more photos. There is some copy kind of defining it. But within that, um, again, all of these incredible first moments, um, what it allows our fans to do is relive those moments again and go back to last year, which right. was just such a special place in their heart. And one of my favorite ones, and I'm sorry, San Jose, but so <laughs> it's, 
we're literally uh, uh, we're one, we're one point away from clinching the Pacific Division yep, Championship, yep, yep. and we're playing San Jose. Yep. It's two two in the third period. We're shorthanded. Our best player, William Carlson, who nobody had ever heard of, who ended up scoring 43 goals last year and was third in the league, he steals a pass, he goes in one-on-one, -on -one, and he literally goes between his legs and scores over the goalie. It was literally the highlight goal of the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, now our fans can go back into this book, scan over the QR code on that image of the actual goal uh, with William Carlson, and then uh, through the app that fans can download onto their phone, relive the 30 second clip oh, wow. of that video. The video. And there's cool. probably 25 of those throughout yeah. the book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and most of them are highlight oriented, but not all of them. Some of them are some of the fun stuff that happened uh, from our game experience, like our, our open that uh, Zach was talking about, um, or the speech that Derek England gave on our home opening game last year that was really so special for our city. Um, but it really is a unique way where we used technology to let people really um, relive all of the great moments of right. the first season. So well, it's a lot that, of fun. That really interesting juxtaposition of sort of old and new, like right. a book with that type of technology, too. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it uh, the, the best compliment I got was my teenage daughters actually saying, this is cool. Okay. And they were like, <laughs> that is high this praise. is cool. High yeah, praise. Very high praise, yeah. and uh, I was really, uh, uh, really proud, and our yeah. team did an unbelievable job. I won't that. ask you how many times they've actually said that about you in the last five years. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, good. So we've only got a couple minutes left. What I thought would be fun is is if we all share a little bit about our own personal views. Again, all of us are probably in this business because we are fans. So if you think about yourself, not as an executive, Zach, or not as somebody who's in the business, but as somebody who is a fan of either sports or events or things like that, what is it that you value? And what is it that you don't? What is the, What are the things that irk you? Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, be, being from San Diego, from a pro sports team, it, it's been hard uh, for, for years. And, and Pete and I share a very small college alma mater, so again, we don't get to watch much. I, 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 mine's Go Mammoths. Simple. Go yes. Mammoths. Go Mammoths. <laughs> uh, mine's just having fun. Like, honestly, I, I just want to go and have fun. So I don't care if as much if we're going to lose. Um, but if I go and, you know, the Warriors don't lose much, but like just to watch them play for eight minutes, how much fun they're having, whipping the ball around, taking shots, that's amazing. Or someone like go and have fun, we'd go early and have a blast and be great after watching the beginning of Carrie's, you know, game and then obviously stay there for it. But that is fun. Or if there is a place, a venue that I really, we know has an amazing type of restaurant that we don't get to go to and just go experience that or if there's some walk up. So it's a simple, fun experience. I I'm, guess I'm a little jaded because the teams just haven't won historically on a professional level. Uh, so it's more about like just interacting and having fun. Like I, I love some of the content that you see a lot of basketball clubs put out um, that have nothing to do with the game. It's just really fun, witty humor. So I, I'm a fan of it. Yeah. Mine drilled down to just fun for me. Chopper, does he think he's um, as a fan? What do you value? What, do you, what, what, what irks you? I'll, I'll say sort of like the behind the scenes moments. I, I think for me, you know, I've been – a uh, Duke basketball fan since I was little. Both my parents, both my, my dad's parents attended. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I always loved every year as, as part of the youth club for the basketball team was you got a letter from Coach K. And it was mass produced and it went to everybody. But it sort of gave you this inside look on, like, here's what I think the season's going to go. Watch out for this guy. And it was just a one-page thing. But it felt so special because at that point, you know, you see 15, 20, 25 games a year, and the presentation starts to feel a little stale. There's only so much that you're learning from watching each individual game. And while they're incredibly fun in and of themselves, that that uniqueness of getting some of that behind the scenes look, I think is really special. And so whether it's the team doing it or the coach doing it, or, you know, ESPN actually just put out an eight part documentary on the Duke team this year, uh, that was fantastic. Um, you know, those moments where you get to learn a little bit more as a fan and, and you get a, just a slightly different angle on the team that you care so much about, to me, it's just a, a, a priceless opportunity to engage in a different fashion. I love it. I love it. Do you still have the letter? Uh, they had one every year, so you yeah. know it was uh, it was kind of a, a fun thing to collect. <laughs> Scarfy. Well, I, I think one of the things, just sort of, when I go as a fan, and I, and maybe this is sort of acute now that I think about this sort of every day. <laughs> now that you're out of it. Yeah, <laughs> no, but I, I I I sort of I pay a lot of attention to the things that that are sort of uh, make it difficult for me to enjoy an event, right? Uh, and, and this sort of idea that there's a lot of uncertainty around, you know, going to a big sporting event. Hmm. And, and, and certainly in Los Angeles, the uncertainty around the traffic and how long it's gonna take there and how, how on earth am I gonna park? And, 
you know, I was just, you know, backstage, we were talking about this, I, I went to the Rose Bowl. And, I, and, and the Rose Bowl is very unique because it's in Pasadena and it's this old venue. But I had this, like, terrible experience, right, with, with the parking thing. And it just sort of, like, soured the entire mood. And it took us, like, a good half an hour to sort of get over it, right? We were sort of still uh, uh, complaining about it as yeah. the game was kicking yeah. off, right? Perhaps a couple of malted beverages, too. Yeah. Uh, yeah and yeah. so anyway, so that, that this idea that this opportunity of removing some of that uncertainty uh, in that experience, I think, will go a long way in, in sort of you know, furthering the enjoyment. Mm -hmm. I love it. Amy. Well, I'm not going to go into parking at the U.S. Open because yeah. that's a nightmare. <laughs> Parking's <laughs> yeah, yeah. totally a nightmare. Is um, although I do appreciate, as a fan, uh, good wayfinding. Uh, you know, it sounds geeky, um, but it's incredibly important to me um, as you know someone that goes to a lot of events. Um, from a fan perspective, um, I'm, I'm biased because um, I you know work at the USTA, but I've been going to the U.S. Open since I was four. Um, because I was, um, you know, fortunate enough for my father to have um, seats, and uh, we went every single year. And um, from a fan experience, there, it's the exploration of things, um, in the sense of walking around and, you know, seeing different ways to actually um, watch tennis, whether it's up close um, on one of the practice courts or one of the field courts or in some of the different new stadiums. Um, it's different vantage points of. of kind of consuming tennis, um, and so it's an educational level, um, is what really um, I, I get my biggest enjoyment of. And, you know, now with, you know, the technology that is at hand um, to have kind of information about the players right in front of you on your mobile device, about their stats, um, and, um, you know, have they, have they played this person before, um, I just find that, you know, whole concept fascinating from a fan expect Love expectation. It. Carrie. I, I mean, at the end of the day, I am a fan, Yeah. and um, I view the game I, in a lot of ways like a fan, and I'm a game ops junkie, mm. <laughs> and I love the warm-ups, I love the music, I love the introductions. Every time play stopped, I'm watching the videos. Some videos we do every game, and I see them every time, and I laugh every time <laughs> because they're funny to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and I just love that part of it. In the period, or the third period, we score a big goal. I'm hiving, high-fiving and hugging everybody I can find. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, it's because I'm a fan. And when that stuff's not fun anymore, mm. I'm going to go do something else. Right. And I think that's what, uh, you know, what drives, you know, drives me every day. And I, I just love the, the presentation of the game and the event. And uh, I love the show part of it. It's a lot of fun. It really it. is. Good. I want to thank you guys. This has been great. I feel like we could have talked for a couple of hours here. Um, so thank you guys. And I hope you guys have a great day. Enjoy, enjoy CS. Thank you.